And now we're we're, uh, we're moving on to the uh, the mental side of things with uh, Dr. John uh, Olaf. He comes to us uh, from Vancouver, uh, British Com British Columbia. He's a full professor in the School of Nursing. He's the founder and lead investigator in the UBC Men's Health Research Program, with uh, his research uh, focusing on men's health behavior uh, and uh, illness illness uh, management. So please uh, welcome uh, Dr. John Olaf. So um, to be honest, I'm a men's health researcher. Uh, it's kind of what I do, and I do all things men's health, things around prostate cancer, uh, things around depression, uh, things around issues around um, smoking cessation amongst men. So I'm hoping today to be able to convince you that it's a noble enterprise and it's well worth thinking about and well worth addressing, um, not in a way that excludes women, in fact, in a way that invites women into the conversation, but also yields great benefits for women and families if we're able to help the health of men in a variety of areas. Um, so I really wanted to, uh, to be able to talk at length about some of the work that we've done, but I'd want to situate men's health a little bit. Most of us tend to get the art hister version of what men's health is about, and it tends to be about difference and disparity, and it kind of sets up a competingness. Um, and I actually think it's a long way from the truth. Um, so just to say, that when I talk about men's health, I talk about two things. I talk about sex and gender. Sex being the biology, so the things that make men, men. The anatomy, you know, the reproductive organs, and also the differences in those reproductive organs compared to women. So that's, you know, the sex part of it. But the gender part of it's also interesting. They're the things about how we learn, how to be men, how to be women. And they really do infiltrate and influence the way that we do health and our health practices. So the biology is really important, don't get me wrong, but the behaviours are incredibly important as well. So an example of gender is if you think about the smoking rates, say, in China. So 96% of the smokers in China are men. So only 4%. And in fact, the smoking rates amongst women are going down in China while they continue to be up around the 56% of all men in China smoke. And it's a classic case of gender. There's nothing about the sex or biology that says that guys are predisposed to smoking. And so again, just thinking about how we do the business of men's health and how we think about gender and how we think about women's health and we think about gender, it's helpful to think about more than the politics of difference. For the longest time, we've talked about men's health, about being about life expectancy. Men die sooner than women, so we should focus on men's health. And we've talked about men don't go to the doctor. And I'm going to help try and debunk some of those things today and talk a little bit about how we might think about that data. So if we look at life expectancy, it's interesting. You know, back in the day in the 80s, uh, the disparity in Alberta was around 7.5 7 years. And now it's closing. It's down to 4.5 years and we're all living longer. And so in a lot of ways, we think about those four and a half years, you know, where those four and a half years go. But the fact that it's closing, I'd suggest that in four or five years, we're going to start to see the gap close again. It'll close over time. In 20 years, it'll be a moot point that we're talking about men's health because of, of life expectancy differences. Instead, when we think about the 4.5 years that are currently lost, we should be thinking about what the causes of those are. And in order, it's heart disease, it's suicide, it's motor vehicle accidents, it's HIV, and liver failure, most often secondary to alcohol overuse. And so those things to me are interesting for a variety of reasons. Three reasons. One is that they seem so amenable to interventions. They seem so like things that you could make a difference in and reduce the, the, the a loss of guys to these things. 
they also, it's kind of interesting being a researcher because we tend to disaggregate everything. We look at one thing at a time. But I actually think these are so deeply clustered together, plus or minus a cancer diagnosis. So I think they occur, we try to disaggregate them, but in so many ways they infiltrate us, you know, uh, as a collective, as comorbidities, as a primary problem. And the third and probably most important thing is that they are relational. And by that I simply mean that men's health impacts everybody. For every suicide, for every heart disease, for every prostate cancer, for every liver failure, it impacts family and it impacts women and other men. So if we can intervene with men and make a difference about behaviours, then we might be able to make a difference for everybody. So your intervention point might be men, but it's not necessarily you know, a piece that you're suggesting that the benefit is only yielded to them. Men's use of healthcare services. So this is interesting too, because the history suggests that men don't go to the doctor. So this recent US Department of Health and Health Services campaign, only two years back, put up this placard and a way of messaging guys that they need to think about preventative health measures. They need to think about being screened for different things. You know, it's interesting because obviously someone got to the sign <laughs> and kind of affirmed it in some ways. But nonetheless, the devil is in the detail about how many guys go to doctors and what sort of connections they have. So if, again, if you return to the statistics, you can see. So in the case of whether a percentage of guys without a regular medical doctor, you can see it's much higher than women. And yes, we've controlled for obstetrics and gynecological kind of, you know, annual pap smears and those sorts of things. So we've controlled for that. And we still have guys less connected to the healthcare system. And if you disaggregate then, looking by age, you can see that it's the working years, it's the family raising years, where we're probably less inclined to be going and seeing a doctor. And then if you dis disaggregate again by place, and you look at Alberta, you'll see that Alberta resides above the national average. The national average is 14.9%. So Alberta you know, resides at 18.7%. So you can see that the devil really is in the detail about, you know, guys don't go to the doctor as much or don't have a regular doctor per se. But what we do know from the statistics as well is that across every emergency room in Canada, men are represented approximately 3% more often than women. So 53% of our clientele in the ER are men. So men do go to doctors, they just tend to go to emergency room doctors because they tend to wait longer and they tend to uh, uh, act on a number of cardinal symptoms, most often of which is pain. So among those people who have polled about uh, not having a regular doctor, um, the guys responded, 46.7 of the guys responded that they weren't looking for a doctor. And so, but there's also mechanistic reasons for it. 31.9% said their doctor wasn't taking new patients. So again, these are things that kind of, the devil being in the detail about why guys, you know, aren't necessarily deeply connected to healthcare services. When we paint an epidemiological picture and we claim it as black and white, in terms of men's health v women's health, it's really, it's really naive because they're so deeply connected, but also because these things change and they change a lot over time. So I encourage us all to think about, you know, men's health as being uh, a conduit to family health to being a conduit to women's health. It's my 101 around men's health. And now I'd like to talk about three things. One is prostate cancer support groups who we've been doing research with for almost a decade, over a decade now, um, here in Canada. I'd like to also talk about some issues around depression amongst men. And I'll tail out with a little nod to um, some work we're doing in smoking cessation. So in 2005, we were amongst the very first people to be 
funded for anything in men's health and it was looking at prostate cancer support groups. Um, I had done a PhD in Australia and I'd been recruiting men uh, for a study about prostate cancer from support groups and everything I was reading about you know, men's health was a suggestion that men don't look after their health. And then I'd walk into these rooms where the, the prostate cancer support groups would be operating and it was the complete opposite. It was the antithesis of that. These guys were really doing health really well. They were engaging around illness. They were having pretty frank conversations that apparently guys don't really have. And it was quite amazing. And I thought, look, if we could bottle this, if we could actually put this into a formula and spread it around, we'd actually have guys engaging with their health in way more nuanced ways. So in some ways, I sort of felt like the, the prostate cancer support groups were the, were the flagship of, of men's health, really, the untold story of, of men's health. So we were lucky enough to get funded. It took us a little while, but, but we eventually got lucky enough to be funded. And through 2005 and two th through 2005 through 2009, we went around to, you know, 20-some prostate cancer support groups. We observed them. We interviewed guys about going to a prostate cancer support group. We also noticed that 20% of the people at prostate cancer support groups were women. And we interviewed the women about what it's like to go to a prostate cancer support group. So it was very, very deeply connected in, in what is often talked about as the couple's disease. I won't belabor the results too much, but, but I will give a bit of a nod to the things that we did find. So in terms of humour, and, and, uh, and uh, George, with the lunchtime piece, it, it's, it's a, classic, a classic way of engaging people, it, it, of, of lightening the moment, of bringing them into a conversation, but a very poignant conversation is very dear to him and resonates with the group. And the humour to do that is quite unique. So, you know, oftentimes we'd go to groups and the guy would start by saying, welcome to the club you never wanted to join. And he'd bring the new guys in because it's pretty, it's difficult, it's different. We're not really, guys aren't really acculturated to be in groups unless it's a, a football club and, and they're doing something. It's not about talking very often. So the humour is, is absolutely, you know, uh, key to why these groups work. The other piece around health promotion, you know, this is the birthplace, or at least Ottawa is the birthplace of health promotion. You know, the Ottawa Charter, um, I mean, and the groups did health promotion so well because it was the light and shade. It was the, the ability to talk about the illness, talk about the prostate cancer and what goes with it, but also there's this real focus on health, diet, exercise, those sorts of things that go along with it. So it was wonderful in terms of being able to do health promotion, but also what I would term as illness demotion. It actually normatised, you know, the illness because it's a shared experience. Hard to get. The couples at support groups were really interesting as well. We, ha we had 16 couples who we talked to about the experience of going to support groups. And um, it was interesting because, you know, a lot of times the women would be helping the guys to manage their health, kind of helping them along. Oftentimes they might have actually brought them into a group in the first place. So wonderful supports in that way. And then we saw some groups that broke into uh, uh, gendered groups, you know, after the main talk. And so the women would be together and they'd be able to talk about some of the issues that they might be sharing at the time as well. And I think spousal support is huge. You know, it's hard to get, it's hard to negotiate, it's hard to coordinate. And a lot of it was happening at the groups. Health literacy is interesting. You know, if you read the literature around health literacy in Canada, we say that older people aren't literate. Uh, I remember the first group I went to, uh, having, you know, had a bit of uh, education in, in health, I actually had to go back to the books and really try and decipher the numbers that were being thrown around and a lot of the terms. There's a very, very high level of literacy in prostate cancer support groups. Like, you guys talk in numbers, you understand the numbers, you, you actually understand the ambiguity. So it's kind of, it's very, very interesting and very, very powerful because also understanding those things and understanding the, uh, uh, the anomalies with those things can really help craft questions for when you are engaged with a clinician. So it was another thing we thought they did really well. The women's you know, roles, we just noticed at the, at the groups oftentimes looked like background supporters, but indeed they were kind of like the social glue in a lot of ways for the groups that we saw. 
So this was four years' work. You know, we just sort of keep writing papers, writing papers, and thinking about these things. Our analysis gets better with time, we hope. And, uh, but one of the things that stood out very early on was that, you know, of the hundred odd groups across Canada that are, that are burgeoning and, and been uh, doing really well over the last 20 years, there's a lot of groups that fall over. So the sustainability of the groups is an issue, you know, uh, a long-standing issue, and it's directly linked to leadership. So the one, the, the, the one paper that we'll, we'll craft out of this, the, the final paper, is around leadership, but it's really looking at facilitation at a shared workload um, and succession planning, like any good business, you know, being able to share the wear of it and being able to keep the groups going. Differentiating between leadership and management, and, and by that I mean simply, you know, le leadership is about vision, it's about days like this, but the management oftentimes is about the operational part of those monthly meetings, and they take a lot of work and you need people on the ground to be able to do those. And a united vision and, and, and really allocating your resources in a way that you can to sustain the business of what you're intending to do. A lot of people say to me, they say, oh, John, look, it's great, mate, you, you, that, you, that you like the support groups, it's terrific, you know, but only 5% of men go to prostate cancer support groups. I don't believe that we have built anything professionally that's attracted more than 5% of men to, uh, to groups uh, or, or to uh, psychosocial oncology services in a way that is free, <laughs> volunteer-based um, and open. Uh, uh, and I often say to the leaders when they sort of talk to me about the groups too, and they sort of say, oh, John, we can't, we can't retain members, we can't keep people coming back. And I actually believe that it's okay. I think it's all right to have a bloke come in once, get what he needs and goes. I think it's all right. Sure, you need some people who are going to stay on and help other blokes out, but at the same time, don't underestimate helping someone out with a single consult. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. It's interesting too that you know, psychosocial oncology services are not well uh, 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 attended by men. You know, that, that guys don't tend to go. But at the same time, there's in the literature there's an un, there's a report that men are underserved in that in that very area. So it's kind of kind of interesting. It's kind of an anomaly. So the paper that I mentioned here um, uh, around sustainability, you know, has been has been well received, I think, probably by the prostate cancer community uh, as much as anything. But of course, the truth of academic papers is that we write them and no one reads them, or very few people read them. Um, you know, you, because one, they're long, they can be a bit unwieldy, and they can also be actually restricted in terms of the access for people to these papers. So again, with CIHR's help, you know, we put together a website, we Wrote, we, we kind of condensed the findings, so any 8,000 word papers become 80 word, you know, abstracts, not abstracts, really just general chats about what we found and how we found it. And then we invited in some of the best known people in prostate cancer in Canada to, to read our papers and to be interviewed about what they thought about our papers, because that way we didn't sort of feel like we were being all parochial and tooting our own horn about what we'd found. We really brought some people in to, to chat about that. Um, this is uh, Larry Goldenberg, and uh, thank you. Well, I mean, there is going to be misinformation because the field is changing. Vitamin E, not that many years ago, was thought to be a great chemo preventive agent, and the select study was done, and it turns out vitamin E is not very good. In fact, it could be detrimental. Same with selenium. So the science is changing. The, you know, the, the, the uh, misinformation, if you will, I'm not sure that's the right term, the um, information itself changes over time. So the groups have to keep up the best that they can. There are a lot of, I hate to use the word, but I will, quacks out there, especially on the internet, who are offering all kinds of alternatives. I think that has to be filtered through a support group. The, I think it comes down to the leadership of those support groups to make sure that that information is filtered appropriately. If there's a question, invite a healthcare provider, a scientist, someone who has an expertise in the field to come and talk to the group. So Larry's interesting, he, um, a big fan, big fan of the groups. And, you know, uh, says some really important things there. One of the, one of the I think, misapprehensions around groups is this notion of, of misinformation. I think Larry does a really nice job there 
of suggesting that it is a field that's moving all the time. So the chance of misinformation is high in a lot of places, uh, not the least of which is, is support groups, but it's not real misinformation, it's probably right for its time. And I think you know, our experience of going to the groups is that they're very measured in how they talk about you know, the, the work of prostate cancer and also the, the treatment decision making, which is a lot of what guys turn up for. So just to, to finish off the trilogy, you know, so we're into, uh, heading into 2017 to finish off this work. Um, and what we've sort of done is we went back to the healthcare providers and we sort of asked them, we polled them about, you know, what they, what they really thought about prostate cancer support groups. In large part because, you know, referrals are really important for guys coming through the groups, really important in terms of reaching, pe reaching people, couples as well. And so we polled them about that. And then the second part, we talked to a lot of guys who couldn't get to a support group because they might be, you know, in regional and rural areas that didn't have a support group face to face. And they had some ideas about what could be really helpful for them in terms of an online piece. So again, we, we moved into survey questionnaires at this point, you know, to ask about, you know, the good things, the benefits of, of support groups, also the, the, the negative potential things that were happening reasons for attending um, and reasons for not attending. So i just give you the, the, the bees knees of it. Um, just to say, we, we polled uh, 140 general practitioners, 150 specialists and 101 nurses. You know, the boomer generation X, you know, healthcare provider age group is, is right there along the, uh, the mid to late 40s. The splits in terms of gender uh, uh, represent those, those vocations as well obviously much higher numbers of female nurses, much higher numbers of specialists, male specialists, and a, and a sort of emergence of GPs. So it kind of, it reflects um, female GPs, you know, increasing in this country, but also it reflects the healthcare system pretty well with an average of, you know, 13 and 14 years. So by far and above, you know, the, the people who've got the least connection to prostate cancer support groups and don't know so much about prostate cancer support groups even existing are GPs, which is interesting. And the specialists actually that we polled actually had a really good feel for the groups and 78% uh, uh, and of them reported actually referring patients to groups. And nurses also, you know, kind of had presented at groups, you know, so presented content, but also referred quite a lot of, uh, a lot of patients uh, to, to support groups. So when we asked about the positive influence, is interesting, you know, healthcare providers know that men and women turn up for information. They also, the specialists are interesting though because they kind, of, they kind of believe that in some ways it's really about sharing the experiences. So it's kind of interesting in that respect. If you look at why men choose to attend, you know, again, it's, it, it works out that it's information and that, you know, goes well with the previous slide. But really it's about discussing um, uh, uh, cancer treatments as well. This is the, one of the interesting ones for us. There's still this lingering doubt about misleading or inaccurate information within the group. So even despite, you know, what Larry says there, you know, there's still this lingering doubt that, that, it's, uh, that, that, that some of that information might not be as, as helpful or as good as it could be. Um, that concern about dominant members, you know, that might be particularly pushing a, uh, a particular point of view and also the chance that it sem somehow might disrupt men in terms of de decisional conflict. So when we asked about how come guys might choose not to go to a group, privacy was one of the issues, you know, the major issue, but also they suggested a lack of knowledge about the groups. We know that when uh, a healthcare provider mentions a, a prostate cancer support group, the guy is about 50% more likely to go to a group and have a look at the group, even if it's just once. So it's kind of interesting, it kind of helps us to think about how we might work with healthcare providers to try and you know, more deeply engage the professional and the community-based services, you know, to be able to buoy a, uh, a, an oftentimes a strained public healthcare system. So with that in mind, we then went back and we did focus group interviews with healthcare providers, with guys who went to groups, with guys who didn't go to groups, all in the hope of building a website. So it's interesting when you, when you put in prostate cancer in the Google, it's 26 million hits. 
Um, I reckon there's probably a bit of misinformation in those 26 million sites, just at a guess. But also, it's very ambitious to be trying to think about, you know, producing uh, a website when there's so much out there. We sort of knew what we didn't want to be. We didn't want to be a library because we figured there's enough libraries out there. We wanted to take the essence of what a support group looked like, the good things that happen at a support group, and we didn't want to be sort of channeling people into specific areas. We wanted to really help people think about different aspects of the disease and side effects as well. And we wanted to be video centric. Um, so just to say, this is one of the videos that we're going to have on the site. I'll just share it with you. The site's not up just yet, but this is one of them. I've been asked, what are the five myths about using a vacuum erection device, a VED? Well, one, I think people think it's a sex toy. A prescribable, medical grade vacuum device is not a sex toy. It's nothing you buy at the sex store. Another concern is with the guys is, will this hurt or cause damage to my penis or to the surgery I had for my prostatectomy? The answer is no. If done right, a medical vacuum erection device will not cause you damage. It's the opposite. It will achieve what it's supposed to do. There's no pain and no discomfort using it whatsoever if done properly. Another myth I'm, told, I'm asked is, well, if I'm using the vacuum and it's pulling the blood into my penis and I'm getting my, my erection back, could, could I get it a little longer than I had before, a little bigger? And the answer is no. You, you got what God gave you, what you're born with. One of the effects, and I've asked this for the guys the myth is, uh, will my erections be as, as straight as before? And that depends. Some guys, if they've had a prostatectomy, uh, will suffer from a hinge effect. Actually, suffer is not the right word. They're going to have it. And here's what it is. If your penis is usually erect like this, the hinge effect is it's not like this. Because from the ring on, we can control how much blood's in your penis. But that much of your penis inside your body, we cannot control. So hence, you have a hinge effect. That's all. Another myth they have about using a VED, it comes with rings. And the rings go on the penis after you've got the erection. And that's what keeps the blood into the penis to maintain the erection. So some guys will say, well, I, I can get the erection with the pump. I don't need the rings. Wrong. You see that in sex toys in the stores. They just come with a little pump. And they say, oh, this is great. This is not the case. This is a medical device to help get your erections when you're suffering from erectile dysfunction. Once the blood's in the penis, the ring goes on. It caps to make sure the blood stays in the penis. So again, the kind of things that you hear of and about at prostate cancer support groups, oftentimes, you know, off in the off in the corner in the refreshment break, you know, those kind of conversations about some of the changes that people have noticed, some of the things that people have tried. And so we've been try, we've really tried to be very authentic around this sort of stuff, and 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 in how it would be done at support groups and how it would be talked about at support groups. So there's lots of challenges with this, and and, and we're well aware of trying to put together a, a website. There's also the nature of the business in the research is that we're often well-funded to describe problems, not so well-funded to achieve sustainable solutions. You know, kind of got to keep coming up with problems. And so in a lot of ways, the website we're hoping to hand off to PCC or to the foundation in British Columbia, once we've got it working and got it tested, um, you know, with, uh, with potential end users. The other thing that we're on the hook for with research is to evaluate these websites. And Google Analytics is one way. It's not the most sophisticated way, but we do learn a little bit about our patronage, about who goes to the websites and what sort of length of time they're staying on for. The most disappointing piece around this data is when you look at the bounce rate at being 58.6, that means that they're landing on the front page and leaving before looking at any other content. So you're losing 60% of your landers in there. Nonetheless, we've had uh, 2,600 you know, unique views but, uh, and 1,500 returns. So, you know, it's been two, this is for the previous website, so it's, you know, it's allowed us to sort of think about, you know, a couple of things with the website and that way. They stay on for a couple of minutes. Um, and then we looked at the YouTube. So we spend all this time building a website and what we found is, is all the traffic is coming through YouTube. So people are actually going to YouTube, they're signing in, and they're actually going to the videos that are on our site, but also hosted on YouTube. 
So we spend all of this time building these elaborate websites and so everything links and is nice and connected when in fact the, most of our visitors come in through a YouTube website. The good thing about YouTube channels is that you can actually, if people are signed in, you can see a little bit more about them, not just which country they're from, but some more about their demographics. So for example, of our, uh, our 2,479 people that came in through YouTube, 72% of them were male, and 45% of that 72% were between the ages of 45 and 54. So it helps you think, okay, well, we're, we're making some impact with the audience we, we were kind of hoping to be able to reach, and they're staying on for a minute 12. So all of our videos are around that length, not much longer than a minute or two. And that was really you know, told to us by the experts that people really don't stay on very long in terms of watching videos. So we learn a little bit you know, each time with the, with the prostate cancer piece and we learn a little bit about the web, uh, the web applications. The other, so switching gears a little bit, just to say we also do work in men's depression and suicide. The interesting piece, one of the interesting pieces around this is that men are diagnosed at half the rate of women with, on, with depression, but they suicide at four times the rate of women. So our hypothesis is, is the black box that is, that, that is the piece where you go, well, hang on, if we're not diagnosing depression and we know that, that you know, severe depression is a major pathway to suicide, what are we missing? So there's a few things we're missing. One is that generic screening tools you know, tend to miss a lot of guys in terms of their depression. Guys will often present with irritability, uh, anger, um, over-involvement in sports and work, overuse of alcohol. And so they're often depressive symptoms and we don't always pick them up. So a lot of times a guy can be harboring a depression and we're just not getting it. I think too, you know, when guys go to the doctor, it's, it's interesting, it's hard to say you've got depression. You know, it's, 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 it's equated with weakness in large part. Um, and it's also, because not many guys get formally diagnosed, in some ways it's almost crafted as a woman's disease. And so there's this, this bit that you've got to have insight and then you have to be able to articulate that insight. So we've interviewed over, over 150 guys who've, who've got depression, either formally diagnosed or experienced depression, depressive symptoms, and they never say depression. They say stressed, I'm stressed. I'm a bit worn out, I'm stressed. And so it's kind of interesting, even the language we use around depression. So with Movember's help, you know, we've, uh, we've been funded to do some work and we started with the baseline. We actually went to, uh, we ran a baseline about, you know, depression and suicide in men. And we polled uh, 901 people across Canada. It's matched to the census data, and by that I mean age, um, occupation, uh, experience, you know, exposure to depression, suicide, mental health. It's actually, you know, we've been able to get a sample that is representative of the widest sample in Canada. So we're happy with that. But what we're not so sure about is that 23% of Canadian men surveyed had been diagnosed or treated for depression. 23% of Canadian men had considered or attempted suicide. 26% of Canadian adults, so this is men and women, surveyed said they had a close friend who had discussed or attempted suicide in the past 10 years, and 46% of Canadian adults surveyed had a close male friend or fan, uh, family member or friend who had been diagnosed or treated with depression in the past 10 years. Staggering. And then we actually asked the guys about the ones who'd actually had some, uh, some experience, direct experience of depression. And what we got back from them was 57% of, of them indicated that they'd feel embarrassed about seeking professional help for depression. And over two thirds of the respondents who'd personally experienced depression or suicidal thoughts also agreed that the statement, with the statement that I should be able to pull myself together. So it's a tough one. It's a, it's, it's a really important area. You know, we're obviously thrilled that Movember have been uh, you know, able to support it. They put $12 million in uh, back in 2012, another close to 12 million uh, last year. Um, it, the money's unprecedented. We've never had money for men's mental health and it's really so important. So we've got six projects going with, with Movember at the moment. I won't belabor them, uh, but just to say that 
they're all looking at particular groups of men. So, for example, the online help is looking at men between 30 and 55 and helping them self-manage depression and depressive symptoms. The Dudes Club, it, uh, it's a group that occurs in the downtown east side, uh, socially, economically disadvantaged area in, in Vancouver, and it's, for, um, it's run by a physician and it caters to First Nations men often disenfranchised with uh, drug addiction I issues and homelessness. The men's sheds, which has worked really well in Australia because it's got government money. There is a, there is a shed in Canada, it's uh, in Winnipeg, and we're um, working with Movember to expand the sheds across Canada. So we've got ones in Pemberton, got one in Kelowna, working through to one in, in, in uh, uh, White Rock as well. And the, and the men's sheds are really just a space where men oftentimes older, going through transitions in their life, be it unemployment, bereavement, divorce, going through you know, tough times, can connect with other guys in a way that they're doing things, actually doing activities. Um, the Man Up Against Suicide Project is about um, interviewing people with photographs around their experiences of having lost a male to suicide, all with the idea about producing um, suicide prevention strategies within this country. So. They're, the, they're four of them. The one I want to focus on today is the Men's Transition Program. It's an interesting one. This one started out with guys coming back from Afghanistan. Um, these two counselling psychologists from, uh, from UBC, Marv Westwood and a physician, David Cool, um, could see that there were issues with the guys coming back from, from Afghanistan in terms of reacclimatising the civilian life. And uh, they worked with these men in groups. The interesting thing is they never say to the guys, they never sort of go to the guys and go, oh, you need help. They never do that. They actually say, there's some mates of yours, there's some other blokes that could really do with a hand. Would you mind coming in and helping us? And they bring them into the group and they work with these guys over an intensive 10-day period. Takes me back to, I was, back, I was here in Calgary when, uh, for one of the national meetings of the prostate cancer groups and it kind of brings me back to, you know, the war metaphor because what these guys have done, Marv Westwood and David Cool have done, is they've actually taken this program and they're now administering it to it, they're pilot testing it with men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer. Because they believe that the transitions for some men are so challenging that these kind of facilitated, skilled kind of counselling, for want of a better term, they call it coaching, uh, can really help guys through some of the tough times. So they, with Movember's help again, we've been able to pilot test these across three provinces, British Columbia, Quebec and, and Nova Scotia. And of course we're collecting the data around this and, and trying to understand how it's working for people and how we can adjust it to be better. But I do want to share with you uh, one of the fellas who's been through in, in British Columbia and his name's Jack and 68 year old former high school teacher is a principal, in fact, and he shared this after three days intensive work with four other survivors in a group um, having been diagnosed with prostate cancer and treated. Uh, and he says, I quote, up until a couple of months ago, I had no idea what depression was like. Now I believe I have a new appreciation of what it can be to be in deep despair with absolutely no hope. The combination of my prostate cancer therapies, 25 heavy doses of radiation and hormone, hormone therapy treatments literally took the life out of me. I was at the point um, early this week that I felt totally worthless as a man and over the past couple of weeks I've been seriously contemplating suicide. He went to a, he went to a support group and at the support group they were recruiting for this Movember uh, funded project, uh, the, the Men's Transition Program. And he says, having gone through that group, he signed up, gone through the group. He said, last Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, I spent 24 hours over three days with four fellow prostate cancer survivors and three very professional counsellors. We, we told our stories, we wrote our stories, we shared our cancer, our life experience. But most of all, for me, I was able to actually tell someone that I was depressed and suicidal. Long story short, I've realised I was grieving my manhood. I've lost what is, the very, what is very precious for a man. I cried, did I ever cry? Now, I'm at peace. Sure, I miss my testosterone, but I know 
I am still a man, not defined by my sexual ability. I'm a husband, a father, a grandfather, a friend, a hockey player, and a child of God. I am valuable. So I've realised that suicide has, has such collateral damage in the family that it is unbelievable. It is like pulling the pin on two grenades. One is in your hand, and the other one you toss into the family gathered behind you. And this is not the legacy that I want to leave. It is unbelievable to me, last Saturday... I would have said, let's go play with grenades. We have nothing to lose. One week later, I feel like a thousand pounds has been lifted off my back. It's a pretty powerful testimonial. It's a, it's a, and sure, it's an N of one. And sometimes we discount the narrative and sometimes we sort of say it's not, you know, it's not the, the most important thing. But I, I tell you, I'd argue it is. You know, in terms of being able to help people with psychosocial aspects of, the, of prostate cancer, I think it... It speaks volumes to the fact that if we can get guys to connect and if they can feel like they've got a connection, an authentic connection and a way of having a conversation that they can't normally have, it really can be something, really can be very, very powerful. I, one of the other things that, that we're sort of finding in terms of self-management things for guys that might not have the opportunity to connect with other survivors is around um, issues around exercise. And I know, I'm sure Nicole will speak about this, I'm sure Mark spoke about it this morning, um, and, and there's really, really good evidence that across cancers and prostate cancer as well, that if you are able to, you know, engage in physical activity, it, it's not only good for your, for your cancer, it's actually good in terms of treating and reducing, you know, depression. Exercise in a prescribed regime can make a real difference in terms of mood and affect, both in terms of reducing and established depression and depressive symptoms, but also in reducing the potential for depression to set in. So, and what she's suggesting is that if we can get prescri prescription exercise, you know, a bit beyond the, the kind of the 10,000 steps mantra, but something that's a bit more titrated to our needs, age and other demographics, that it will make a real difference in terms of mental health. The last thing I want to talk about is smoking. Um, and, and to be clear, this doesn't come from a place of judgment. I give the cigarettes a fair nudge as a young bloke, and, uh, and I know how hard they are to get off. I really, I'm intimately aware of how tough they are. Um, and it's fascinating to me that, you know, we feel like no one smokes in British Columbia, you know, in Vancouver at least. Um, but the numbers are actually quite interesting. So the smoking rates in Canada are still 19%. You're a little bit higher in Alberta, and you've got, you're higher than the national average in terms of men and lower in terms of the national average, you know, in terms of women who smoke. The connections between, you know, cancer and smoking are well founded. But also, I guess, you know, these days we talk about how, you know, if someone is smoking, it can reduce the therapies that we're trying to provide in terms of cancer treatments, chemotherapy and the like. And, that, and that's, that's significant. But also the fact that this secondhand smoke issue that really has been shown to be a really big issue for things like breast cancer in terms of exposure to secondhand smoke can really heighten the risk for people who have never smoked in terms of developing uh, breast cancer. So again, we, th we looked at this and we thought about, well, you know, how can we help in terms of developing some strategies that would talk to men that would help them reduce their smoking? And again, there's good reason for that. If a man smokes and he's in a family there's a 50% higher chance that the wife will smoke and there's also a 50% higher chance that the child will grow up to be a smoker. So again, it's that whole thing. You intervene with men and you hope to make a difference with other people around them. So with the Canadian Cancer Society's funding this time round, we worked with a place called Quit Now, who've got an established database, an established um, patronage on their website for quitting smoking. So it's kind of interesting. They uh, have 30,000 registered users, you know, so these people sign on, sign up and use the, the, the different uh, opportunities on the website to think about quitting and there's strategies there and there's ways of reporting and you can get coaching tips and things like that. But only a third of those people, of those 30,000 registered users were men. So again, it's discordant, right? More men smoke and less guys are looking for help. So. We built this website, it's very, very plain um, and it's been interesting. Um, it just, you know, when guys go to this website, they, they are really looking for a plan and they're looking for strategies. 
And so we talk in terms of playbooks, we talk in, time, in terms of having a plan, tactics and tools, you know, uh, and the page that they land most on is the, uh, the calculator page. And it's a very simple page, you know, you put in, you pin in the number of cigarettes, the number of packets of cigarettes, your average price, and then you come out with the number, and this is the highest landing spot for guys, you know, in thinking about the money. So we're trying to talk to guys in ways about, you know, their motivations rather than, you know, smoking is bad for you, which they already know and most people do. And so it's really trying to guide some tactics. And we've talked about, you know, having a wingman as well. The, the idea that having a buddy who's trying to quit as well or a smoke-free man as your mentor can actually be a good way to, to work through it. What was interesting about the launch of this site was that we offered $2,500 for, you know, a, a potential prize for someone who was smoking, a man who was smoking that could give up for a week um, from February 1 through February 8. And we had over 10,000 unique visits to the website. So again, you know, oftentimes I'm not suggesting that it's the silver bullet in terms of ceasing smoking, but what I am saying is that to bring guys into the things that talk to them can be the first step towards helping them reduce and quit smoking. And of course, that has benefits for everyone around them. So, um, in closing out, um, survivorship is interesting, um, I think, because we're all living longer. And if we're all lucky enough to be able to retire at 65, you know, we've at the moment got at least 20 years to think about in terms of surviving in what is an economically uncertain time. Um, and when you throw in cancer to the mix, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that get laid on top of that. You know, the indirect costs of travelling for treatments or the direct costs of some treatments. You know, uh, the loss of income. Uh, I've got a PhD student, uh, Wella Miyuka, who's doing some work with prostate cancer and guys of working age you know, and it does suggest that they, the guys get pushed out into retirement a little bit earlier than they might have hoped on a lot of occasions. And so survivorship, I, you know, for me, you know, in my experience of talking to survivors and talking to people, you know, in general, is really, you know, it's multifaceted. It's not always just about the cancer. Oftentimes it's about the life circumstances and the things that go in, on and around, you know, the cancer. And I hope in some way today, been able to um, uh, to point to some of those things about some of those psychosocial pieces that are so important. Most of our work is on the web, you know, um, and in large part, it sort of augments uh, a public healthcare system that is often challenged, you know, to keep up as we have an ageing population and an increased number of older people in Canada. So it's meant, never meant to replace, but it is truly meant to augment and truly trying to make a difference to the life of men and women and families in this country. Usually what happens at the end of a presentation is that, you know, people would summon, you know, questions of the person who's been speaking for the last hour. But I've got a couple of questions for you. And, 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 and they are, you know, why is the life expectancies between women and, and men closing? How come? Um, and why is the overall expectancy, life expectancy in Canada increasing? Because I, I think it's a really useful conversation to have and really something helpful to think about. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for all the speaker. We really enjoyed all the talks. Um, this is not a question, but I've noticed uh, I just have I just had surgery, so I'm having trouble breathing. Um, I've always volunteered at the schools, at the elementary schools, junior high, etc. Despite the fact that I was a working woman, and what I've noticed with these foundation, they could use some help. And uh, my suggestion is. Um, can we do the same thing that we did toward the environment with kids in the elementary school through plays, through, through uh, uh, debate? Uh, they, they had so many fun things. 
I don't even dare in my own house. My boys are 27, 24, and if I throw a bottle in the garbage, I'll have two people right behind me going, Mom, I have to save the environment. But when I go and say to my 27, can you please go and check for prostate cancer? It's not all about growing mustache in November. You really have to walk to the clinic. <laughs> and he goes, no. Stubborn again, back to that thing. So I'm just wondering if we, uh, all these organization can put together some thoughts into my suggestion and uh, maybe uh, take advantage of a lot of um, acting schools, etc., to put on a play as a donation toward the cancer and get the kids, even at the age of grade five or four, to play that role that it is okay, that they can actually partner with a girl during that debate mm -hmm. and make it like the environment question and make it uh, hopefully a success. And that's just a suggestion. I'm sorry if I'm mm, out great. of breath. That's great. You know, um, I appreciate your point and it's a really valid point. You know, we talk about men's health, we talk about women's health, we rarely talk about boys and girls. You know, and so um, never underestimate your influence, you know, uh, intergenerationally with, 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 uh, with kids and, 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 and your kids in particular and so. But um, I totally agree with you. It's, it's, it's about trying to model a different way of being. And I think especially amongst men, never underestimate the influence of an older guy mentoring you or, or someone who's doing something a bit differently that, that's yielding good outcomes. Because I think they're, they're very potent drivers of change. So thanks for your comment, eh? Yeah. I've got another quick question. So I mean, we, we've had some success with these support groups at the Prostate Cancer Center in, uh, in Calgary, and I'm, I'm always impressed on, on how new, newly diagnosed patients and how useful this is. But I think we maybe we've, we've failed in some of the other cancers. We don't seem to have the, these uh, structured groups. How do we take a model uh, that's been successful in prostate cancer, how do we take it to something like bladder cancer, which I obviously have a research, research interest in, and our kidney cancer? Um, how do we copy these structures and, and uh, help other, uh, other malignancies? Yeah, agreed. Um, I, I think, you know, one of, the, one of the strengths of prostate cancer support groups is they're mixed, so I think that's great. That lends itself well to things like other non-sex specific cancer types. What the groups tend to do well, they run, run a pretty good format, as you, as you no doubt know, and you know, it, it, it kind of, it's, it's a fairly formal kind of you know, situation. There's a lot of good information. I've heard some of the best speakers in the country turn up on a Saturday morning and talk about their recent research at a support group, much like the card today, you know, pretty, pretty amazing people, talent in the room that's talking. And, and so people go for information but then they, there's also this kind of this, the ones that seem to work the best to me are the ones who've got a little bit of room for the chat, you know, and uh, some of them split by treatment modalities and kind of get into some of that. But, you know, if you've got that nice kind of formal didactic kind of education piece and then you've got that opportunity to connect with others, I think it's a really nice blend. And I don't know where else it happens, to be honest. So. Again, if we could bottle that and think about that in terms of other groups then, uh, and, and other cancer sites, because there's specific things people like to know at, at certain times. And, and, uh, and so I think you know, splitting by, by cancer site is a, is a way of thinking about how to do business in, in the broader community in terms of psychosocial. Yeah. I co-facilitate I co and run a bladder cancer support group at a Wellspring. And my partner's not here today, he's still on vacation, lucky him in Mexico. Um, but um, exactly what you're saying, I have tried for three years to get people to come out. I don't know what it is about bladder cancer, but I get, I've tried speakers of all size shapes. I've tried nutrition, I've tried education. I haven't had successfully gotten a research person out, but um, I've tried a lot of different things. I've tried speakers. I've tried having some nights open for discussion. And I get people coming, 
they'll come for a few meetings, then they'll disappear. Some are, I've got a core group of about six that come out fairly regularly, but that's it. it the membership has not grown despite my advertising, the work Ben and I have put into it. So I don't know where to go. You make a good point, but I am really stuck. And so if anyone here has any indications or suggestions how I can make this work, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah. I don't have the remedy for you either, but I would say that, you know, I guess what I'm trying to point to in, in having surveyed the healthcare providers is that I, I, I think they're a real conduit. You know, it, it, their influence can't be underestimated in terms of, you know, did you know about this group, that we've got a group, you know, it might be something you want to do. You know, not, not a direct referral in any way, but, but a, a way of going, you know, this, this works for some people, you might want to try it out. Um, and I do think that opens, opens up the possibility. It also, in a lot of ways, it provides permission. You know, if you, in, if you kind of endorse something as being working for some people, not a guarantee, then most people, will, if they're looking for something, if they're that way inclined and they want a group, then they'll at least give it a shot. So somehow bridging that community-based health promotion piece with the professional services, I think could work for everybody. You know, professional services and, and you know, the people accessing. I think you might be underestimating your, your impact as, as well that you're yeah. making. I mean, it's hard to, to judge yeah. what impact you are doing. I mean, look, I look at Bladder Cancer Canada, which is another group that uh, didn't, yeah, that didn't start all that long ago, and it's, ca it's catching uh, uh, momentum. So I, mean, I think you need to keep pushing uh, on those things, and you may not see the rewards uh, right away. I mean, Prostate Cancer Canada and all these groups have been around for, for many more years, so, so keep at it. Yes, uh, I think that uh, possibly some of the, the problem may be that uh, I ran into uh, when I was first uh, diagnosed. And uh, what do I do now? Well, I was referred to a group that was supposed to be a support group. Ran out of the Rocky View. Oh, they haven't been here for years. We don't know where they are. And I was just in absolute limbo for about three years. And then, to be honest, I can't remember how I got in touch with it but I hit the prostate center here in Calgary. And I think a lot of it is uh, this information should be available through your medical people. Uh, when I first went to the Tom Baker, we had a big sit down and they went through diets and, and all this sort of thing. And oh, you can get this book and you can get that book and some of them were here. But I thought, well, what about support groups? And I think this is where people are going to look if you've got cancer, regardless of what it is, I think Tom Baker, or example in Calgary, is an area that could be promoting all these available uh, help groups. And uh, certainly, again, through the medical profession as well. Uh, when my doctor says, oh, well, you've got to go in for uh, your, your uh, uh, biopsy and things of this nature, well, that's all we do. We, we can't refer you to anywhere. So as I say, I think it's a learning curve on their side as well and to direct you. Yeah, and, and, and it's a very good point. And, and not to, um, to self-promote, but just to say that the website, um, uh, prostatecancerhelpyourself.ubc.ca, the people who are endorsing the groups are healthcare providers and specialists across the country. So if you've ever got someone who you're thinking might benefit by a group, what we've really tried to do is demystify the groups, that, that they, these are the things they do well, you know, and, and professionals are talking to it. So again, we're trying to make that conduit, but I totally agree. Well, I know for me this is a big step. I mean, for years you think, oh gosh, I have no information. The doctors didn't seem to be passing it on. It's like it was a secret thing. They, 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 are they going to tell me next week I'll be gone? Uh, or uh, there's a new uh, drug available, but uh, it's, it's a secret. We can't tell you about it yet. So there's this, all this hesitation and everything else. And as I say, this, this group, uh, I'm with the Warriors group here in Calgary, and it was just phenomenal. I mean, it was just such an uplifting experience and getting to chat and, and talk over with other people with similar, and I soon learned that, hey, all sorts of different stages of this. This fellow is different from the one I have. And then suddenly, they say, oh, he's got the same things I had. And this worked for him, and this didn't work for him. 
and it's just amazing. And I want to say thank you for the organization of this. This has been a fantastic seminar. Congratulations to you all. Thank you.